that comes up is uh, folks who have oligometastatic disease and you know only have a few spots on the bone or the lymph nodes. And Dr. Vaughn, do you have, what's your experience with managing oligometastatic disease? Sure. So you know, I think that there have been a couple of trials that have looked at the outcomes of kind of um, you know targeted disease to these limited areas of metastases, the STOMP trial, the Oriol trial. And in, in both of those trials, in men with oligometastatic, uh, hormone-sensitive disease, up to three areas of metastases on conventional imaging, um, there certainly is a radiographic progression-free survival and, and um, kind of PSA progression benefit um, in those men who re do receive some sort of metastases-directed therapy, um, either via radiation or surgery. I think the important question to ask is what is the goal? Mm -hmm. Is the goal to avoid further systemic therapy or is the goal to consolidate the disease? Um, and so keeping that question in mind, uh, you can then help the patient you know, kind of make that decision. But certainly there is some benefit to be had. So um, I'll ask this to everybody, everybody can chime in on, on this kind of concept. If you had a, a man who had cash rate sensitive disease, let's just say the PSA was 30, they had um, three or four bone lesions, uh, one in the pelvis, two, three in the spine, um, and uh, that man was on ADT and an ARPI, and they did get radiation to the, um, uh, by SBRT to the metastatic sites. And maybe even, uh, according to Stampede, they even got radiation to the prostate. Well then, if that man had therapy for a certain number of years, maybe two, three years, and was then still disease-free, would you take the patient off therapy? Dr. Smoothie, I'll start with you. I would think so. In yeah. fact, I would also think hard about even putting them on it, because at the end of the day, these people, you really need to also think about their quality of life. Mm -hmm. Systemic therapy, let's be honest, it does compromise their quality of life, and I think um, if we can random, render them disease-free with these um, metastasis-directed therapies, I think we can make a pretty strong argument to not even put them on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would certainly favor stopping at some point when, when there is no progression of disease if they're already on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know there is data slowly coming out that is now looking at you know, similar clinical scenarios with next generation imaging. And we know that if we can identify even smaller sites of disease on PSMA PET imaging and target those areas of metastases, we are achieving, you know, we're clearing more disease than we thought we were with conventional imaging and the outcome is gonna be better. And so I think, again, you know, continuing on this theme of next generation imaging is gonna allow us to hopefully help patients avoid the toxicities of systemic care. Okay, talk about that next generation imaging, because we did kind of start out with, you know, um, the, the auxamon uh, scanning, then you had um, fusiclavine, then you had other things, and now I think we're using one of the gallium um, molecules that I think our system uses, pilflufostat. So, you know, hopefully these radio tracers are getting better and better as we go along, so. Yes, and yes. there are a number of different radio tracers that each of those tracers have their own strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and so, again, do we know which one is the best? We don't, and I don't think, you know, that answer doesn't exist right now. Yeah, gotcha. And then, um, how are we looking at um, when a man is on ADT and an ARPI, um, who, who do we think is like at high risk for progression? You know, and I'll ask uh, you, you all on this side about, you know, when you see a man who you're just worried, who makes you worried? I think, Definitely, there are some biopsy findings right off the bat that would make you worried, right? Like a um, Gleason score, eight or above, um, which is, you know, grade group four, five, these patients. Certainly patients that have <clears throat> some variant histologies that show up. I think there's some papers looking into the meaning of intraductal and cribriform findings on some of our biopsies. Um, people with strong family histories, I think that's a, that can be a concerning aspect as well. Yeah. How about PSA nadir? What do you think about PSA nadir? Yeah, PSA nadir is important. So, you know, obviously the lower it goes, the better, mm -hmm. and the faster it gets there. You know, it's so interesting when I'm listening to all of your answers, and you're all right, and I, I think about how nuanced this can be. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, prostate cancer is not one disease. It's many diseases and it can, be, uh, and can show 
um, many different types of things and different patients. And so how you treat an 85-year-old man with prostate cancer versus a 50-year-old man with prostate cancer or a Gleason 9 cancer that has a high genomic score uh, versus a Gleason 6, 3 plus 3 cancer. So I think every individual has to be looked at as an individual and really kind of the entire picture because what is best from an oncologic standpoint may hurt their cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. uh, their metabolic syndrome, their bone health, uh, their quality of life. And so being measured and really kind of taking the entire patient as a whole can help with those decisions. You know, who am I scared of on? You know, how uh, you know, fast PSA rises, yeah. you know, high risk genomic scores, uh, Gleason score, volume of disease, volume of metastases, uh, radiographic progression, you know, all that is not just the one thing, but it's how each individual piece of that puzzle fits and how the patient is, you know, responding to the therapy. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and then um, a, a lot of us are, you know, also uh, using triplet therapies. And so um, one of the things was, you know, the original triplet trials, as you were talking about before, only use conventional imaging. But if you had a man who maybe they did get a CT bone scan and they had minimal disease, they had almost no metastatic disease, but then on PSMA, they had what you would consider criteria. Do, do you find that you make a different decision based on PSMA for triplet therapy, you know? I, you know, as a urologist, I don't, you know, you know, give taxatier or doxataxel, but certainly when we discuss our patients that I diagnose, and, you know, you certainly treat a lot of my patients, Dr. Rowe, Dr. Sabute, from a medical oncology standpoint, my younger, healthier patients, I try to push you guys to be aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel that these uh, PSMA scans are just showing us what we would have seen yeah. three years later. So we're just finding disease at an earlier uh, date, yeah. and but we know what's gonna happen. I mean, we know what uh, the outcome's gonna be. Yeah. And whenever a new drug or new paradigm or new intervention comes on, it always starts with our worst, you know, metastatic, yeah. castrate-resistant prostate yeah. cancer patients, and then we see the improvement as that is pushed closer and closer yeah. and closer uh, to disease. So I find no, yeah. you know, no trouble in pushing triple therapy in my younger, healthy patients yeah. with with metastatic disease as found on these uh, on these uh, radiographic imaging. So I definitely push you guys to be yeah. aggressive in the younger, healthier patients. And I do too. I think that, you know, if you have PSMA PET scan that shows high volume disease, just because it may not be evident on, you know, bone scan, you know, I just think the bone scan is so inferior. So I, I do also, you know, recommend a more aggressive course, you know, for the younger, fitter patients. Obviously, there's a lot of men who just can't take uh, dac uh, tax uh, docetaxel, but you just gotta and I don't find it closes any doors for yeah. the future, too. If you give the dose of doxotaxel, you guys could comment on that better. You know, all of the options are still on the table in the future. So uh, you're not kind of boxing yourself into any particular treatment algorithm. Yeah. No, definitely. I think uh, uh, thinking in terms of triplet therapy has really, um, of course, with the Addison's and um, Peace One trials uh, at, at, as brought into limelight, but the PSMA scan itself, it really has um, opened that opportunity for a lot more patients. But one caveat I wanted to mention here is uh, this thing called uh, stage migration. Mm -hmm. So in, there are situations where, um, I mean, of course, most of the times we like um, to think that, oh, we are upgrading someone from a low volume to a high volume disease where we could potentially consider a triple, triplet therapy. But there are times when you actually notice an extra one or two um, lesions that you would not have noticed on a conventional imaging. And even though that would put them technically as a high volume disease, you really want to think, should, we, you, should you really be treating them in that way? And at times, maybe there are those low risk situations where you could potentially just do the local, ther local regional therapies to those and not give the third drug. So. And to add to what Dr. Sapute is saying is that, you know, we can always use that next generation imaging to track treatment response, yeah. even if we want to rely on conventional imaging to maybe justify doublet therapy rather than triplet therapy. But that doesn't mean we can't use PET scanning to, right. to track the response to treatment or progression for that matter. Mm -hmm.